I want to talk about something called Credo. And you say, what is Credo? I hope you all got this little piece of paper this morning when you came in. Credo essentially is a Latinism, which means what I believe. We have it in our English language. We say something is incredible, do we not? It's unbelievable. Credible, credulity. That's all the same basic word. It has to do with belief. But very often in a seminary, and this was true in Unity's own ministerial school for many years, I don't know whether it still is, the students were asked to write out a personal credo indicating what they believed, the core beliefs that they held, which they were basing their faith and indeed their careers upon. This is not, a, not an, an unusual or unfair question to ask. Now, it's true that in unity, we're very relaxed about these things. If you have come from one of our more one of our more established denominations, you will be familiar perhaps with a catechism which teaches you what to believe. Uh, we don't do that. We say, okay, we have some principles, some wonderful ideas which we sometimes call the truth with a capital T, which is a little daring perhaps. But we say if you follow these, you will get practical results in your lives. After all, when Unity School started out, it was Unity School of Practical Christianity. If it works, great. I'm a pragmatist. These principles, and many like them, do work. So, now Mr. Fillmore, our co-founder, used sometimes to irritate those who questioned him. They say, well, what, what do you believe, Mr. Fillmore? And he would tell them, but he said, I reserve the right to change my mind tomorrow, which discombobulated a lot of people, because we all like certainty, don't we? Especially in those whom we believe are our teachers. But we are open-minded in unity. We encourage you to look inside yourself and to come up with these truth principles. The remarkable thing is that if you really do search, and if you're in company with your fellow searchers, you will discover that many of the things that you come up with, they've come up with too. Because in unity, in unity, we are not seekers. We are claimers. And there's a big distinction. If you're seeking something, you're never sure perhaps what it is, or you have an idealized view of what it might be, what it might constitute. But you have that idea, but when... When you claim, you're saying, it's there. I know it's there. It's in me. It's there. I only have to learn to claim it. So we are not seekers. We know what we're looking for. Peace, joy, fulfillment, wholeness, satisfaction, love, all of these wonderful things. But they're there. But we have to learn how to claim them, which is basically what we try to do in unity. So this little credo, I've my own here on one side, I'm, did somebody go? No. Because you might, I might well ask, this is my credo, but have I, like Mr. Fillmore, changed my mind since I wrote it down? Well, uh, no, I haven't, as a matter of fact, which is, 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 is uh, believe me, um, I wouldn't disparage Mr. Fillmore, but he, he changed his mind, but I think he sought and claimed also, and that was a basic part of his belief system. But this little credo here, believe it or not, I shared with you four or five years ago. Some of you may even have a copy of it someplace, because it hasn't changed. But on the other side, now this is how you get wonderful service in our church. Where else can you come to church and get something in return like this, something to take home with you. Isn't that great? We give, you, we give you breakfast, and we give you this to take home. I mean, come on. This is a pretty good bargain around here. So you get this little piece of paper with my credo on one side and room for yours on the other, and you can do what you want with it. Don't take that too literally. But So what, what was my personal credo? Okay, I begin... I believe in a purpose for my existence. I believe in a purpose for my existence. 
Now think about that. Think about that. Do the animals we see in the field, up the trees, in the air, do they believe in a purpose for their existence? They're driven primarily, we assume, by instinct. They don't self-reflect. We are the creatures that self-reflect. What the Greeks call zoon logoi, the creature with the word, the creature that thinks and reflects. There was in 17th century France, here we go back to glottal stops again, I certainly hope we don't, there was a philosopher and a mathematician, no mean mathematician, in uh, 17th, um, um, rather 18th century France, and um, he got to thinking about things and thinking about his existence and trying to figure out how he could prove he existed. And he came up with a little, a little simple phrase. He said, I think, therefore I am. I think, therefore, in Latin, you want it in Latin, you want class, cogito ergo sum. I, he, he, he was a Frenchman, so he said, je pense dont je suis. This sounds much more sophisticated in French, don't you think? <laughs> je pense, dont je suis. I think, therefore I am. His name was Cartesius Descartes in French. And he based his entire philosophy on this notion. I think, therefore I am. And if I am, there must be a purpose for my existence. There has to be some kind of purpose for my being here, for my life that unfolds. I'm not just an unthinking creature in the field. And because there is a purpose for my existence, I may be driven to ask what that really is and to pursue notions of how my sense of purpose may help me to understand what spiritual growth really is. So I put down, I do believe in a purpose for my existence. And I say then, I believe that that purpose has to do with growth. Well, growth, what, what, what do you mean by growth? That's a sort of universal word, isn't it? Growth in what? I don't know. The stock market? Uh, who knows? Well, it means personal growth. It means spiritual growth. We have the capacity to find these remarkable strengths and powers within us that are the very foundation and basis of what we are and what we were created to be. That's the astounding realization. Once we've acknowledged a purpose for our existence, we acknowledge that that purpose has to do with our growth in understanding. And that realization unites us to the forward movement of creation because creation is constant transformation. It is growth. It is movement from one stage of existence to another. And we are indubitably and inevitably and eternally, choose whichever one they like, a part of that process. I don't like the word process. It begins to make us sound like a piece of cheese. But, but, but we are part of that movement. So, I believe that purpose has to do with growth. I believe that God is one and that one is intelligent life. The eternal cosmos, that is God to me. God has never been an anthropomorphic figure for me. I'm sorry to keep knocking you with these Greek words, but they crop up in theology. Anthropos, man, morphe, form. I don't believe in a God in human form. I never did. I couldn't bring myself to do so. But that's partly because nobody ever took me to church when I was a kid. But I could never get my head around the notion that there was a super terrestrial person. The image and likeness that we may share with God is that of intelligent purpose. Intelligent purpose. The realization that we are part of infinite life. I'm a monist in philosophy, I've told you that, and that doesn't mean anything to most people, I realize. But I believe there is only one, and that one is, to use synonyms, intelligence, life, whatever, but we are always a part of it. Can we explain how or why? Well, spiritual growth moves us into a greater understanding of those possibilities. I say I believe that I am an expression of that one. And this is something else that I believe, that God needs me through whom to express. Now that sounds to some people virtually blasphemous. Oh no, we need God. But I say no, God needs us. If God is intelligence, life, if you want to use synonyms for God, 
then that life, that intelligence has to flow through the creation that is manifest, does it not? Seems to me a fairly simple equation, even conforms to a certain degree of logic. And I do have a degree in logic. I try not to use it because it... <laughs> we don't want to go there. But, but, think about it. Think about it. I mean, uh, we are needed by that which made us. What an astounding realization. Of course, it is mutual to a certain extent. There is a mutuality. We need to believe in that which made us or that something made us for a purpose. But by the same token, it would be a pretty, a pretty sterile existence if that purpose didn't work out through the, created, through the created evidences. We are needed by what made us. That's how it expresses. I've said I believe in eternal life the life before my birth and the life after my so-called death. Um, you should have come to that seminar we had the other Saturday, by the way, uh, on the continuum. How many of you came to that? Oh, I'm delighted. Thank you so much. Well, that, I can knock out five minutes of my talk now. Then. <laughs> no, I, I, believe, I believe in eternal life. In fact, sometimes when I conduct a memorial service, I indulge in the sin of the double negative and say, there is nowhere in the universe where life is not. Life is the universe, if you want to continue to use synonyms to try to explain it. The universe is intelligence, it is life, and there is always a purpose and a role for us in that. There is, I believe, powerfully. You can interpret that in any way that you wish, but that's a belief that I have. I say, I believe I must affirm these, be these beliefs as often as possible. Why do you think we have a community like this? Because we can find like-minded people. We are not zombies. We can think whatever we want. We haven't been catechized and told what to believe. We're all free thinkers in that regard. But in a unity community, we tend to find others who have had similar thoughts and are moving towards similar deeper realization of the meaning and purpose of their existence. It's rather exciting, as a matter of fact. Some of us are a little flaky, but, you know... <laughs> Okay, you know, that's great. Why not? <laughs> so, so, we're better to affirm these beliefs than in a community of the like-minded, which is what we are. Don't let this community perish, my friends, because this is, this is the best place you have to learn and to grow in one another's company. I mean, do you want to sit in a cell and do it all on your own? Come and join others who are seeking, who are searching, who are discovering, who are amazed sometimes at the realization that they're not separate from, but part of this astounding cosmos. That's why I'm not a dualist, because I don't believe that's there and I'm here. It's all one. Think it through. Be great. I believe that we must live a simple life so that the pursuits of the material world from which I must learn do not cause me to forget my divine identity. In other words, I'm worried about the stock market. I'm worried about my investments. I can't afford a brand new car. Our property taxes in Washington State just doubled in five years. So nobody can say I'm not aware, not aware of the material life and its demands that are made upon me. But, but, I'm not going to let them dominate my existence, thank you very much. I am going to meet the demands made upon me insofar as I can, carry out the duties that have been assigned to me, but the material world doesn't drive me. And more to the point, it is not the material world that confers upon me the dignity of purpose. It does not confer upon me the dignity of purpose. I may have a villa in the south of France, I may have three Bentleys and a Lamborghini down the road, but they are not my purpose, they are not my identity. Enjoy them while you may, as long as you're not screwing someone else to do it. But that's fair enough. That's fair enough. But this is not the true identity that we are. So, I believe I came into this world and this expression of the one with a soul consciousness. And I believe this soul consciousness will be all that I take with me. What is a soul consciousness? 
I don't know. <laughs> Have you ever seen one pickled in a jar of formalin? <laughs> oh, look, this is my favourite, so I like this one because it's kind of blue and it's got this little bit on the end. You know. <laughs> now, the Greeks believed that the soul occupied the occipital opening at the back of the skull because they couldn't understand why there was a space there. And... Um, <laughs> Not sure I know either, but the, the aforementioned French philosopher believed that it was located the soul in the pituitary gland. I suppose, why not? What is a soul? It, it, it's, it's shorthand for the collective consciousness, I suppose, that we gather. Who knows what it is? Maybe it's, maybe it's a quantum of energy. Might very well be. But it is essentially, I believe, what we gather on this journey in this life. So I put that down and I said, Lord, let my soul have grown here on earth in the company with others on the path toward the light of your being. A somewhat, a somewhat um, romantic sentiment, I think, perhaps culled from too much reading of 19th century Victorian religious literature. <laughs> but having, which is not a favorite of mine, I should say. But having said that, Having said that, this was my credo years ago, and to my amazement, uh, um, frank amazement, it still pretty much is. So, write your own. It can be one word, it can be one line. You can fill the entire back of this piece of paper so generously given to you this morning. Um, I'm a little disappointed in the stock. I was hoping we'd have something a little more pretentious, but... Um, <laughs> There you are, it should last for as long as we do on this planet, so um, take this with you. Some of you diary, some of you have uh, personal narratives you write, but um, use this and put down your own credo, and then when I come here again in five years' time, we'll compare and see. <laughs> I'll shut up. One thing I've always had in this church is fun. I, you know, the biggest thing that troubles me, I'm, now I'm going to ruin everybody. The biggest thing that troubles me in church, I've sat here on three occasions in this seat. I, I worry because you can't see it, but that, that circle in the window is off center. <laughs> I, I'm an old pilot, and any, any instrument, I tend to look at that like a compass. And I, I sit there. <laughs> so just edge it over. Maybe the guy who put it in was having a bad day, but maybe you could edge it over. Oh. But you see, it might, it might have deep symbolic <laughs> significance that I have missed, which is really what worries me. Maybe, maybe it was put there by the Knights Templar or something. I, I don't know.